Uh, my name is Brian Energeski. Um, I'm Information Security System Engineer with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, they are a component of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I'm here to talk about how to stop worrying about application container security. Um, we've been doing it for the past two years in Prod, um, and even a little bit further back in Dev and Test. So I'm here to kind of share some best practices, a few war stories, and then kind of what we consider kind of like critical controls to focus on in our maturity model. We're the world's largest immigration agency that exists. We process 7.6 million applications in a year, over 1 million permanent residents, 730,000 uh, new citizens, and including military personnel. We're fee funded, we are not taxpayer funded. We collect over 4 billion in annual revenue. So we operate like a company and in government segment the rules and regulations that are in place. Um, we have over 17,000 employees in over 200 locations, both in the U.S. and overseas, usually in consulates with the Department of State. Uh, for myself, uh, I work in the cyber defense branch that reports directly to our uh, deputy CISO. Uh, my specializations there are in application security, uh, DevSecOps, uh, CloudSec, and also in hardening. Um, that all comes from my prior IT experiences where I did basic help desk support in person and over the phone, um, web development back in the dot-com boom and bust, uh, system administration, program management, uh, did, had a stint as a forensic examiner at one point, security exercise development with the public, releasing exercises for gamification uh, and getting results back, um, security auditing and control testing. Um, I've worked in academia, healthcare, risk management, contracting, and then finally government. Um, I'm also an official org rep for DHSNT for the Software Assurance uh, Research and Development, um, which is headed by uh, Kevin Green. So I give input on a lot of uh, those kind of projects and requirements and acquisitions to help advance uh, software assurance. Disclaimers. These are my personal views and not that of my employer. I have to state that ahead of time. So when I say something is my opinion, is my opinion, not of my agency. Um, if I mention any software, open source or commercial, it is not an endorsement. There's laws and regulations. It's a civilian where I have to watch those kind of things. Um, this talk is being recorded and it will be public releasable on OWASP. That'll be our release mechanism for this deck to come out. Our application challenges. So we're a typical large organization. We have mainframe, we have a lot of .NET, a lot of Java, a lot of legacy. Uh, of course, we have a lot of new development too. Some new, some old, some really decrepit. Um, internet, extranet, ex external facing, facing other external uh, agency partners, um, also facing other uh, countries for them querying us. It's all different, and guess what? We got microservices too, why not? Uh, but the key thing uh, from the federal side is we kind of lead a lot on the agile dev DevOps kind of perspectives. And a lot of agencies come to us saying, okay, um, examples would be like IRS or Social Security where they have more traditional SDLC models and they're like, well, how do we get out of that? And we also provide training uh, sometimes fee for service or for free at our facilities for those federal entities to kind of uh, take part where we have our own groups being trained. Guess what, we're building a lot more. So especially on the container side, uh, we have about five major applications and of those there's a good 30 micros deployed with a plan of about 200 within end of year. And those are all handling uh, personal identifiable information, uh, payment processing, um, and some are even doing uh, image processing and critical uh, functions of our business. Our security challenges. Shiny new things, that syndrome. Uh, we were lucky that um, at one point we had a very forward leaning CIO from industry. Um, he brought in a lot of the agile practices and we kind of fitted around how we could figure out how to do it in government, especially with government contracting. Um, but along with that, uh, of course, you're gonna be pulling in every single product that exists on market, both open source and commercial. You gotta send it through a battery of tests and see what it does. Uh, sometimes that involves uh, bringing the vendor on site and seeing and kicking under the hood and seeing what it really does. Uh, this one was a kind of a joke a little bit before uh, this conference started, but incident response application DevOps. So basically security is, comes in either when we block the release or where there's a major security incident. Um, and of course the art of the cyber. So of course uh, cyber everything, cyber that, 
um, and then how that's applied from a rule and regulations. But as security, we're typically the last one to know, and they're usually the first to respond and help them clean up, um, and usually brought in the last hour. Our enterprise container journey. So I'm gonna go over some understanding the basic tech. I'm keeping it very generalized. Um, some of the few short war stories about, uh, by the way, your application container's on fire. Um, and then a basic example of a first trusted container and then how we moved uh, security upstream. Um, and I'm putting container for grow ups because a lot, again, as I iterated before, a lot of people are not putting it in prod. They'll say they're doing it, but when you get down to uh, brass and tacks, we find out they're not. They're used it in dev, they give it in test, but they don't know how to do the prod part. So that's why I'm very proud to say we've been two years in prod. So understanding the basic tech. Containerization is not, is not uh, traditional virtualization. It uses the OS level as its kind of its boundary. It shares the kernel. And then from that kernel, that's where the applications and the binaries uh, execute against the kernel of container runtime typically as a daemon processor as a service, depends if you're talking Linux or Windows. The isolation applies at the process of file system level and network of the OS kernel. So if you're root as the OS, you can see everything downstream of all the containers you got there. So that's why it's critical if you're running the container as root, guess what, you can pivot back up and then pivot back into the other containers and see everything that's going on. Uh, the images are sealed with a crypto hash. So a lot of them are a package management format, typically a tar. But the key thing is when they're actually built and sealed, they all have typically an MD5 or SHA-256, depends which technology you're talking about. And a lot of them are copy on write uh, layered file system. So that means you can literally typically do a history command and you can see all the previous file image layers if they have not flattened them. So that means if they baked creds in, they deleted packages, oh, by the way, some of the packages out on uh, public uh, Docker, they have malware in them. So, Check under the hood, see what you got in there. Um, NIST actually was very forward on this. They actually have a draft publication, uh, like up and timely, 80, which actually defines what microservices, application containers, and system virtual machines are to kind of draw about the distinctions of those. But again, package that runs its components on a shared operating system. Your app container's on fire. Um, so, as we're playing with the technology, kind of seeing where things are going, our first thing's like, okay, let's open, let's enable SSH, which is a bad practice to do in prod, and let's see what we can do. So, we send our security scanners in, kind of so they'd be able to get a map of how the OS looks to the scanner, when we know in reality it's actually just sharing a kernel. And tip, the majority of those tools just basically look at it and say, oh, it looks like a regular OS, oh, by the way, nothing's hardened. Um, so you need that host process in IOPS, right? So jacking with the, uh, when you're logging as root, you can do whatever you want to those containers below. The problem is also that from the container side, if you rack up the processing power and you don't put the, it's completely unbounded, which is the default behavior of most of these technologies unless you explicitly define, they will just consume, just like VMware or other, or Citrix Zen server, they'll just consume all resources and lock everything up all at once. Um, another fun one is to uh, DDoS these containers. Uh, or you can actually do a virtual network tap, because typically a lot of them will, in their technology, use a virtual bridge as a start and a default network, and guess what? That means all that traffic's passing through there, and it's virtual, so just fire up some Wireshark and uh, some PCAP and start inspecting. Um, and since most of the encryption keys are usually local to the, either the container or the container daemon, you have the keys to unlock all that and see all the traffic going through. Uh, pivot as root, that is always a fun one. So you can start in the container, uh, if, it, if it's at the typical default, they will always run at root unless you specify for the user running inside the container not to be root. Um, and once you have that, you can jump into the kernel of the host OS, and then you can hop around wherever you want. Now there are some legitimate uses of what they call a privileged container, which is one that runs at root. Um, typically, some of your defense tools will do that because they have to be able to peer into the other tools to see what's going on. Um, the other one is uh, Amazon ECS will do that for its orchestration tool. So it can control the containers and your EC2 host as well. 
Um, but the key thing here is break the tech to learn the tech. So if you don't know the tech, play around with it, break it. You can do this on your local machine. I usually don't recommend that. I usually recommend some remote machine where you can kind of watch it squirm a little bit. And of course, in a controlled environment, don't make sure it's walled off properly, especially if you're going to be using anything uh, nefarious. My first trusted container. So this is a basic example of a Docker file. Um, what we did is we defined a base source OS at the top with the from line that it would typically pull from like public Docker. Um, don't recommend that from the start. Of, it's good to start that way, but as you mature, you want to pull from your own internal registries. Um, the environment variables. So you can actually inject environment variables at runtime, and what happens is it's a handoff from the, either your orchestration tool or your runtime, and then you can push those environment variables down into the uh, container, and it operates as a local environment variable at that level. Um, so those are some typical ones we do. We, we're in a heavy proxy environment, so defining those strings, uh, we don't bake those in either. That's the other thing. Don't bake in configurations if you don't have to. Uh, the second one, the major one, is the run line. So the first thing we do in a run line is make sure that we're applying patches. Um, not all the containers that are out in public are patched. Um, that comes as a surprise to a lot of developers because they're like, oh, I got it from Docker Hub, it's patched. No, let's pull that down, let's run a CVE check. Oh, by the way, they haven't patched it for over like three or four months. And then you go back to the source and you're like, oh, that's why, because that one's not getting patched. So you gotta, you gotta trace that image stream back to the original OS that it was pulling on. Um, the args and labels, um, args are just basically defining a, a way to do a label, and then the labels for us are metadata tagging, so that we know what the image is, and then when we do like an inspection on that container, then we have some metadata of like where it came from, what was the build process, um, which server it came out of, uh, what Git branch, what Git URL, so we have an easy way to trace back. So moving to security upstream. So, a little hard for me to talk about technologies being used, but frankly, everything is kind of the same. So everything's from Git. Everything's sort code, uh, infrastructure is code. Um, using Jenkins, kind of use that as an automated process. I can talk about that part. Um, so we build our code, depends which language you're talking about. We do our unit and functional test, and then we create the image. The reason we do that is because if it doesn't pass the functional or unit test, there's no point in building the image at that point. Because um, typically that can be run on like a temporary container on the host, which you don't need to do the scans and push up. Um, then we create the image. So our images we require to come from our trusted internal repository in dev, uh, the pull their base image down. Now some of our application owners have, have built their own application base images. So they'll have like JVM preloaded or um, they may have like a, one of the swagger tools preloaded for their tests or mocks, which is fine as long as that stuff stays in, on the dev side. Um, and then of course the se security scans. A um, couple of the tools on market will actually, you can do it right in live in Jenkins, so when it's doing that image build process, you just tag on an additional action, by the way, give me a scan. So from a scanning standpoint, you have two different ways. Typically with an image, um, that'll just, that's kind of like a binary scan, like almost like doing an uh, AV or an SS. It's not gonna be dynamic. It's gonna typically look through the OS. It may look, depending on which vendor or product you're using, um, they'll start looking at your package managers. They may try to uh, start hashing some of your uh, content in there and try to match it against other databases to kind of identify additional vulnerabilities. Um, and then there's also a runtime scan. So the runtime is basically giving a rough profile, okay, I'm running this container, what, is it gonna, what does it look like after about 30 minutes? What does it look like after an hour? And it kind of gives like a snapshot to compare that original start with uh, those change starts to see what processes have changed, what network connections have changed, um, what kernel calls have been made. So you can kind of make a, a rough threat assessment of okay, this container is doing some wacky stuff or Sometimes it's developers um, packaging Java packages and then later um, uh, unloading them into temp space and you're like, well, let's do it this way where it's a little bit more secure. We want it to be unpackaged on run, but before run kicks in. Um, once you pass all those automated scans, and highlighting automated because that's what our policy is internally, um, then that image officially patches, 
passes into the dev. And we have some Git processes that hook between our dev and our prod to watch for those changes. And then it does the promotion. And then it deploys directly to prod. There is no ready, readiness review. There's no paperwork. Um, we operate on our risk management framework. And we go through these different security scans and tests. And we bless them, saying, if these things occur, then we will go to prod, which I know is a little weird in government, because I've been, uh, when I was a uh, Department of Defense, we did fun ATO packages, and every single major release had to re-go through those ATOs. And those can take months and sometimes years. So building the container ecosystem, that is kind of the crux of this, because you can easily run these containers on an individual host and be happy, but making orchestrating those containers is the hard part, which is a lot of people don't talk about, and there's a lot of uh, vendors speak about. So automation, how are you building container images? So some of the, some of the providers have a source to image me mechanisms to bring those in where it will literally see the git commit and then do it itself. Other ones require some Jenkins uh, wetware glue to put, pull together. Uh, repositories, there are a couple different repositories out there. They all have their pluses and minuses. Some have weaknesses. Um, where and how are you storing these container images? For us, we made a position that we're going to have a dev side and a prod side, because we, we have separation uh, for logical access. And for us in prod, that means that's where all the PII lives. That means where all the background investigations have to be completed. Um, every, all that paperwork has to be to a T. Now, the dev test, that doesn't require that. That just means they, don't get, they never get any copies of production data, especially like PII. If it's going to come downstream, it's got to be masked for their test cases. Um, orchestration, so where and how these run. So we are a big, very big cloud user. Um, our uh, one is Amazon that we do. We talk with them all the time. And we, all, we give them constant feedback on how that runs. Um, for us, we, do, we take the logical isolation route because we know in the FedRAMP packages, there is a level of assessment that says, OK, this part's trusted versus this not part. Um, and then we kind of set, OK, this AWS account will do this part, and then this other AWS account will do that part. And then how you split up those uh, server resources within there. Uh, just enough OS. So this goes into, OK, am I going to use a traditional server OS to do this? Yeah, you can. It'll work. Um, but will I use a stripped down OS, where it just minimalistly will run the, um, con the container daemon and pretty much nothing else? Um, some of those are excellent, but that's kind of like, that'll go more into the maturity model on that. Uh, the management and security, a lot of them are not doing runtime monitoring. A lot of them will stop at, okay, image is blessed, it's, I don't see any CVEs, but they're not dealing with the runtime. So typically, you gotta use some kind of third party system uh, to basically monitor from outside with that, which is actually kind of good because from an auditor standpoint, you have something that's assessing the vendor that's outside of that tool set. So learning. So the first thing we went to was the Center for Internet Security Benchmarks. Uh, back then, they weren't as uh, mature as they are, but we kind of helped that along because we kind of donated back to them their community consensus. Um, what they do is they have um, each of the different projects, which are um, public facing. They have a PM that manages it. And then anybody can technically join. You can literally just sign up for now for free and join in their draft publications and contribute. And then they have a community vote on how that thing goes. Uh, so they, they define it in level one and level two per each of their benchmarks. The level one is more of a general, OK, this is how you just basically get this tech out the door and operate it. The level two is where the sensitive system processing is. Of course, that's where we go. Um, what I left out of here is the app has scored and not scored mode as well. So the scored mode is more like uh, objective things you can test for. And usually, typically, the not scored are more subjective. Um, you have the same problem, some of the government and uh, industry ratings, where it says, look for this thing. And you're like, OK, what's the command? Well, it doesn't specify. So I have to kind of subjectively fill in the control. Um, what we do is, for those controls, we define internal policy of how we do those controls. Um, the host OS, the container daemon, the container image, and the container runtime, that entire stack is what drives your security. Um, and most of these are available for cloud. The majority of Linux OSs, the Windows OSs, they're writing the 2016 one right now for Windows, for containers. 
um, and uh, the Dockers and Kubernetes. The Docker one's been a couple versions out now. Um, the Kubernetes one just got released a couple months ago, and they're already editing that for the newest version of Kubernetes. And as I said, most of the draft benchmarks are available as long as you sign up to contribute. Um, completely independent. So these are, these are uh, independent nonprofit. So then this goes back into threat modeling, because then that kind of gives you an idea where to go. And these are kind of like the top three for the threat model for any container that I kind of recommend. Um, look at the data being processed. Because you're, now you're looking, now the kernel's intermixed, so you gotta look at what data's intermixing on that host. Do you really care that your financial data is mixing in with your public web interface? What happens if that gets breached? Um, how sensitive is it to you? And then what access controls do you really have in place? So we're a very big component of trust and verify, um, where we will literally just go against our own infrastructure, take red team, and just not and get a waiver from the CISO and just go and not tell anybody else. Uh, sources of connection. So look at your inputs and your outputs. Are they internal? Are they external? Are you behind a proxy? What are your inputs and what your outputs look like? Uh, force my dev teams to go through that every single time they do through a container and then document it in Git so I don't have to remember again. That kind of gives us a rough like risk assessment posture where we can assign them a risk rating for their release and that risk rating then drives how many security tests they got to go through. So something that's like internal where it's going to be a read-only interface and it's only going to be accessible to another like um, microservice that's a pretty low risk rating because it's going to stay within our network. It's never going to leave their application boundary. I don't really have to worry about that one as hard. Now, the ones that are public facing, yeah, that's gonna be a high risk rating because it has the, most, has the most way of being pivoted out of. There's some mitigation techniques that kind of cut that down, but we have to do our homework. And then the container data persistence. This is something that a lot of people are not talking about. Same with NIST. Um, where are you gonna store that data? Uh, a lot of these ones will do their persistent volumes bound to the host. Guess what, now if that host goes down, there goes your data. Um, are you going to do it to a network share? It's plus and minuses to those different kinds of drivers. NFS, or are you going to be using one of the alpha or beta drivers that's out there, for how to host that? Or cluster FS, those kind of things. And are you just going to use a data software as a service? So, I mean, a Amazon RDS, you can do your own database servers, those kind of things. Where you don't have absolute control of the service, but you, can, you have control of what data goes in and out. And then your expected operations. So both your scaling and your performance load matter. So you have to think, okay, well, if I know the profile for this has this type of I.O., then I know I can go on this type of host in this type of cluster. Uh, or if I'm putting the binding on the con container runtime, then I say, okay, I'm gonna give it this much CPU and this much memory, it can never exceed that. And will the op application still operate as intended? Um, and the container app logs. This is one of my fun topics. Uh, your audit, your error, and your infra level. Um, notice I didn't say debug. So I considered debug to kind of stay out of my environment, stay out of my seam. Um, that's kind of some of those orchestration tools will typically aggregate all the logs for you from the container side, and then you can kind of choose which streams to push off. So countermeasures for the major risk. Um, I'll be frank, a lot of these are straight out of the NIST uh, special publication, um, just with little tweaks from my personal opinions. So the images, so you gotta look at your baked in Vons, your config, your embedded materials, and what your level of trust is. You have to define that as an organization. I highly recommend you document what your trust levels are. Because uh, that makes it clear for when a new dev comes on and they're like, oh, I want this latest and greatest Docker container, you can point to said policy agreed by uh, leadership and be like, no, this is what our policy is. Appreci deconstruct the container, we'll build it our way. Uh, registry, so connection sources matter. So if you have policies that says this is how you do your release schedule like we do, then you need to make sure those connection sources, the ingress and the egress is very controlled. Um, and then you can't easily jump back and forth. And then the image promotion matters. So if you're doing automated processes for that and you're gonna have multiple auditors I have uh, DSS OIG, I have third party auditors, um, and I also have the court of law, which can be if there's a PI breach or those kind of things. 
uh, orchestrator. So the DevOps management. I've seen enough of these tools and heard enough of these tools where basically everyone has admin. That kind of defeats the purpose of the orchestration tool. Um, you give the least privilege uh, for those releases. And in, in prod, you shouldn't, developers typically shouldn't have that. They can have a read-only. They can monitor what's going on. But there should be some kind of dedicated ops team that manages those things, similar to our recommendation, similar to like a VMware or a Citrus cluster. Um, and then the workload ses sensitivity. That matters. That gets into your host separation. Some of the container technology tools that do orchestration today will intermix all your containers on the same host. There is no ability to separate those. Um, and they have no way to make the management orchestrators for some of those tools be able to manage multiple clusters. It is to that one cluster and that cluster only. Um, that's why we don't select some of those tools internally. We've, we like to have our host separation. So public facing, that's one cluster. And then the internal facing, that's another cluster. And sometimes we'll be even more segregation um, depending on the technology where we can assign a specific set of hosts for it to operate on uh, because that belongs to a certain set of firewalls or connections that we allow. Uh, the container ops, so the runtime vons, uh, your runtime drift and your application vons. I kind of discussed it a little bit already. And your data persistence. So your data volume mounts. You can do read-only mounts. You can do write mounts. What, what is comparable for your container? And then my favorite is read-only containers, which can break the app sometimes if the application developer doesn't realize uh, it will do that. There are ways to do temporary mounts to allow that kind of activity to occur. So it occurs in a trusted space. And then you got to tell your, uh, your runtime tools that do your active defense where that's located so it can get whitelisted. So the benefits. So these are the ones that we've seen. And we consider these are kind of like the sweet, tasty cake insides. So the containers will run the same. We will have containers that will run in de in, on the local machines. They'll run in test. They'll lo load in prod. And the only difference is, is they have an external config file that loads the environment variables. We kind of pride ourselves on that. Um, it reduces a lot of the work on my machine issues. So it's repeatable infrastructure and deployment. That's what we're always aiming for. Um, we're not the type to roll back a release. We'll just push the new image back out and destroy whatever was there. Um, and then, of course, the portability matters. That gets a little bit more difficult now that Windows containers exist because there's a little bit of restrictions of how that operates, but that's maturing. Um, and then for DevOps, it produces a higher developer productivity. We're less in the way. We have our tools. Uh, automated tools in path, um, that keeps them happy. Um, and for us, the patches are baked before the release goes out. So that's always the fun part when working with any of the developer teams. Uh, you guys need to do this patch. Uh, it's a zero day. And it patches a couple of your vulnerabilities. Well, that's going to have to go through our test cycles. Well, how long is that going to take? Uh, 20 days? Yeah, I got to report in seven days up to headquarters that how many instances of this exist. Um, more frequent release schedules. So that depends on the DevOps teams. I have ones that are releasing at least two, three times a day. I have other ones that are a little bit slower because they have smaller dev teams and they have less business requirements. Um, and for us, it's about money. So increasing the server utilization as much as we can without popping the uh, application to break, that means more utilization. So our security about it's icing. So we have hardened infrastructure on releases. We work with them. Uh, we call it Tiger Teams. Other basically is embedded, um, where we put it out on Git. We make it very widely available. We publish the images, and we make it available for development teams to kind of start secure from. Uh, the pipeline helps it move left because we get all the automated tests in there, which some of the more traditional tools don't operate or they require a lot of glue. Again, read-only application whitelisting that is the best defense you can get. Um, continuous redeployment of the good known. I don't care if it's bad, just redeploy the good known and move along. No humans in production. So no uh, devs monkeying around with their servers and then saying, oh, I can do this. We, we deny all requests for SSH. Your application logs and the orchestration logs should be able to tell you enough what occurred. Um, and a complete record of changes. So from the orchestration tool, we can see when the container came up, the connections that came in, and then kind of correlate that all together, typically in a log or a seam tool. Depends uh, which technology you're talking about. So our maturity model. 
we focus on the critical items first to reduce the major VONs because those are kind of like, we're using kind of like the 60, 80, 90% uh, kind of model. If you get these basic things first, then you're gonna reject a lot of the issues. Um, of course, you're gonna always gonna mature. There's no, you're never gonna jump in and do everything right, right away, and there's gonna always be little caveats. The key thing is making sure you document those and you're aware of what the industry benchmarks say. You may not always agree. Um, and of always optimizing and always tweaking. And it depends on your organization policies and which orchestration tool and which technology you're using. And I, I love this one, because just the amount of uh, logical separation is insane. <laughs> so host security, we start at the host. So use the standard out-of-box operating system. It's what you're familiar with. And then go right ahead, use the standalone container daemons on the local host. Get some familiarity with how the technology works. Uh, for manage, start using the network container daemons. So you can start using, uh, make it a little bit more complex. Uh, it's okay to know what the default kernel calls and the namespaces are, whatever technology you're using. And then start enforcing the host and container logging then, because you're going to need it later when you get into prod and you, when stuff breaks. Uh, the defined. So the command and control. So your orchestration tool will typically handle that for you. Uh, making your host homogeneous. So that's making sure you're not getting your data mounts on those hosts and make some uh, snowflakes. And establishing your logical groups of hosts. So it's better to get the design down early than later and where you have to change everything up. For us, that's doing the uh, sensitive information processing, different barriers, and making sure those are separated. Uh, restricting your kernel calls by containers to a host. That's when you start getting more advanced. There are some open source tools, commercial tools that will help record that for you, so you kind of know what's going on. Um, sometimes you have to look up and see what that actually is really doing, and do I really need that? Um, and minimalistic hosts. That's when you're saying, okay, I'm done doing the standard operating system. I'm going to use something that's going to be pretty stripped down, and that's all it's going to do. And then your optimization, always reducing your attack surface. So like for us, no SSH. We kind of did that a little bit earlier, but growing pains, and sometimes you just got to learn where things are. And then removing the container binding from certain host dependencies. Uh, Chaos Monkey, we love Chaos Monkey. We bring down our stuff all the time. That was a fun um, assessment to write. Uh, for image security, do all your basics. Do your CV scans right out of the bat. Do it in your package managers. Get your app dependencies. Choose which method you're going to do that. Some of the container defense tools will do that all for you in one shot. Other ones you've got to do through your Jenkins pipelines. And establish your trusted base images early now, because otherwise it's going to become a food fight between security and you to figure out, OK, uh, why do I trust this image? and what is what are the risk to, towards use. And no root users. Get that practice killed off right away. Otherwise, it's an uphill battle. Um, establish your internal registries against for prod and non-prod use. Uh, and build your series of base and framework images, because that helps accelerate the developer. Um, and it also, it also prevents a lot of uh, config drift. And establish your metadata of how you want to tag your images and make it universal, of course, your organization, and then set it in policy. Um, we've been in talks right now in the later stages of optimizing. If it doesn't have metadata tags, it's going to get killed at runtime. Uh, for the define, so this is like chaining your application images. So if your base image updates, <laughs> does your CI CD pipeline then force everything downstream that's related to that to update as well? Um, <laughs> Of course, that can send a fun cascading storm of containers. So of course, rate limit that a little bit. Um, and then recording the processes, the hashes, the networks, and the kernel interactions. This is starting to get more into kind of, instead of black boxing, starting to look in what's under the guts of what's occurring. And that gets into when you start looking at your run times. Uh, the automated redeployment. So if we have a new CVE that drops, then we, have a, we know from an inventory standpoint which Containers have that, and go to those dev teams and go, you need to redo your build deployment patch and then do your release. Um, and then your image and compliance scans. So we have several compliance scans because the CIS benchmark, some of the tools do support that, which will do it at runtime. And we do have policies uh, in place that, hey, we'll break your build if we see those things. You won't go any further until you fix it. Um, and then for stop runtimes, it depends on what kind of activity it is. And then of course, I came from a forensic and cyber threat background, so indicators are compromised. So if you start hashing those processes, 
then you can start matching against your other security tools and see what's really going on in there, if it's something really bad or nefarious, especially if the container gets owned. And then your custom whitelist of your kernel name calls. Not everybody is doing this today. The more paranoid people do. Um, there's some tools to help automate that, or you can use your uh, defense tools, which will kind of capture that, and you can kind of work it that way. And then exporting your runtime threats. Nobody is doing this today. So if you do detect something, uh, put it into an open format. Uh, my personal favorite is Oasis Sticks because it can describe the kill chain. And then I can shove that off in my semen and see what other pieces of the kill chain exist out in my environment and start matching and pivoting. And then the final one's the data and ops management. So get your CI CD down, avoid your data rights to the container file system, because once that container dies, guess what? Your data dies. So you gotta look for persistent data volumes to write it to. Uh, start with your basic auto scaling, and then do those data rights uh, to manage container volumes. And then make sure those container rights are actually happening at the runtime. And it actually is really happening, trust and verify had a couple drivers where they've lied saying it's happening and you go back and you pull it and it's like, oh, that's gone. Uh, enabling read in the containers, that protects against so many different attacks, especially if the, if the app's vulnerable because the attacker only has memory to deal with now. It can't write to the file system, so that limits a lot of their file attack posture. And then uh, when they start doing that, it'll trip up the defender um, for your containers and then it can react. Uh, Data management patterns for data persistence. I mean, mileage may vary, depends on your organization, what technologies you're using underneath, and application secrets. So a lot of these orchestration technologies are in the clear. So they'll inject the application creds in the clear, and they assume a level of trust that if you have the host, guess what, those creds are clear there too. Um, that's why we're working, we have that problem, we know where the, which pieces of technology it is improving. Um, that's why we prefer that, hey, if you're going to have to use privilege creds, make sure those are coming up uh, at your runtime when the container runs, and it's making like sort like an API call or hitting that service to actually grab the creds and use them and then trash them and securely wipe them out of the memory. Um, and these are the three main resources I will always tell you to go to. So in this uh, publications kind of general. They kept it very general in the technology. Uh, the draft two was released back in July. The, I don't know if they're going to do a draft three or what. I don't sit on that committee. I just kind of do the public comment as agency. Um, the CISS security benchmarks, there's plenty of them out there. They have for Docker, they have for Kubernetes, they have for all the major Linux and Windows OSs. Um, and NCC Group's research, which is actually now two years old, but it came out before uh, Black Hat 2016. Understanding and hardening Linux containers, a lot of that applies. They talk about all the different container technologies and the pros and cons of those technologies. Um, and a lot of that actually has not changed. There's slight improvements, but not much. And that's what I got for you guys today.